study about uh, the same in the Great Tribulation. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to this before we enter chapter 7 this morning. Uh, chapter 7 actually describes uh, what's going to happen between the opening of the sixth seal, which we studied last week, and the seventh seal, and, uh, and which is opened by the Lamb of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, we're introduced to the seventh seal book, remember back in chapter five, and then we, uh, having been also introduced before that in chapter four to the throne of God in heaven. Kind of give you a leading up to what we're, we're looking at here in, in the scripture. So in Matthew, we talked about this last week, in Matthew 24, uh, kind of as a comparison and kind of goes with the opening of the seals as Jesus was describing in Matthew chapter 24. And uh, in verses 29 through 31, he kind of summed it up, Jesus did, in Matthew 24. And uh, he said, uh, talking about the, uh, according to Jesus, that the angels will gather together as elect from the four winds of the earth before the wrath of God begins to fall. And this is, uh, this is the, what, the unanimous testimony of Scripture. Uh, and God's people are not appointed under wrath. We're not appointed under wrath as God's people. You read about that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. And Jesus has saved us from the wrath of God, as you read in 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And so in, in, it is the unbelieving, the ungodly men of earth who will taste his wrath. And you read about that in Ephesians 5, 6 and in Colossians 3, 6. So... But what's critical for you and I is critical, therefore, that we study, that, that our study of the revelation, uh, that we to distinguish between what is Satan does and what God does, and between the wrath of Satan and the wrath of God. We need to distinguish that as we do this study. It's important we understand that. Thankfully, as we read 2 Peter 2.9, it says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. So the saved will be spared that wrath of God. So saying all that, looking in chapter 7 here, we see the angels in the first three verses here. It says this in chapter 7, verse 1 of Revelation, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice uh, to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God and their foreheads. The phrase he used here in this verse 1, and after these things, uh, as a reference to the uh, opening of the sixth seal we studied last week. The sixth seal was opening in verses 12 through 17 of chapter 6. The seventh seal will not be opened until Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. And so this Revelation 7 comes between the opening of the sixth and the seventh seal. And uh, when the seventh seal is open, there will be silence in heaven for one half hour. Then the seven angels with the seven trumpets will sound the, the trumpet judgments. And so the seventh trumpet, the seventh trumpet will uh, result in the pouring out of the seven vials of wrath. The trumpets and the vials are the wrath of God. But before all that happens, before that happens, First of all, the 144,000 chosen from the 12 tribes of Israel will be sealed and the redeemed of the ages will be gathered in heaven. That's what the seventh chapter in Revelation is speaking about. It, this is the subject of this chapter seven. There's the two groups who are identified in Revelation chapter seven are illustrated in the Old Testament by two men, Enoch and Noah. Enoch 
The father of Methuselah was 365 years old when the Lord took him. That was in Genesis 5.24. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. It was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That's in Genesis, or excuse me, Hebrews 11, 5. So in, in other words, Enoch was raptured, taken up, translated into heaven. He did not experience a natural death. Note that his rapture experience took place before the flood, not during or after, but before. Noah, on the other hand, was a man who found grace in the eyes of the Lord during a time in which the world was steeped in wickedness. The thoughts of men's uh, hearts were only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he had made man. So God determined he would destroy man from the face of the earth with a flood. But first, he introduced Noah, and he instructed him to build an ark. He spoke to Noah to build an ark. So, that would be the means of physically preserving his family. Though, the downpour of God's wrath upon the borders of the ungodly was being happening. He would be spared. So Noah and his family would be spared. Noah was saved through the uh, through the flood by God and by following God's instruction. He went through it. But the, the door of the ark, remember, the door of the ark was sealed by God, by God's hand of protection. So God's hand of protection was upon Noah and his family. God sealed the door of the ark. And so Noah came out on the other side of the flood, safe and sound, is the point. Noah represents the nation of Israel as seen in the 144,000 who were sealed of God in order that they might be physically preserved through the day of the Lord's wrath upon the unbelieving world. Okay? John saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, says in this first one. This phrase has caused some unbelievers to mock the Bible, saying that it inaccurately describes the earth as flat. The expression, however, refers more to the four directions of the compass, what's being referred to, north, south, east, west. And so the four angels were located in strategic positions uh, on, on the earth to hold back the four winds of the earth. Their, they, their uh, purpose that they had was restraining the wind in order that it might not blow upon the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree, it says here in this verse 1. So, at the sixth seal, there will be a great earthquake, if you, if you read back chapter 6. Volcanoes, eruptions will fill the earth's atmosphere with life choking ash. Remember when Mount St. Helens went out and erupted, and how much all that ash went everywhere? And uh, some people died because of the result of that. And so, you know, that's going to happen. And it's going to cause the, uh, it's going to cause the darkening of the sun. Uh, when the wind will stop it, and the pollutions will hang in the air. No wind will blow it away. Not one cooling breeze will be felt. They're going to hold back the wind. Yeah. Not one leaf will move. Not one ripple or wave will be seen in the ocean or the seas. Think about it. And, this, and, and so the hydrological cycle will temporarily stop, basically. It will be a, a, a very uh, terrifying time when this will happen. And in verse 2, he says here, uh, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. 
another angel. He saw another angel. The, the word another indicates another of the same kind. Okay? John noted several things about this angel. First, he saw it ascending from the east. Second, he saw the angel at the seal of the living God. The seal was a means of providing security and protection, as in the case of the seven seals of the book. The angel carried with him the necessary provision for providing the sealing or protecting of the 144,000. Thirdly, the angel cried with a loud voice to the other four angels, thereby arresting their attention. Okay. Fourth, to the other four was given power to hurt the earth and the sea. So, he says here in verse 3, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Thus, it would seem that they uh, it would be instrumental in unleashing the wrath of God, these four angels, upon the earth and the sea. So, a quick look ahead here to the trumpets and the vile judgments reveals some of the hurt and destruction that will come to the earth and the seas. As you read in Revelation chapter 8 and verses 7 through 13, we'll be studying that next week. And so, the fifth thing we see here is that they were, uh, they were not to hurt earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. They had, a, they had a job to do. But God's timing has to be observed here. God has an exact time for everything he does. Amen. And exact order. So now, they were just waiting to do this. They've been held back for a moment by God. Now look through verses 4 through 8. It talks about these 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. The 144,000 sealed. He said, And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. For the tribe of Judah was sealed 12,000, the tribe of Reuben 12,000. And he goes on down, I'm going to read all this list, but he goes down to all these tribes, 12,000 from each tribe. And there's some interesting things here we can learn from this list. The first question to be asked is, who are they and where are they from? Um, the answer is that they are Jews from the 12 tribes of Israel, it says here in the scripture. They will be the natural descendants of Abraham who will go into the thousand-year reign of Christ over the earth, or the millennium, in mortal bodies and will enjoy the literal fulfillment of all the promises and the covenants which God made with Abraham. Isaac and Jacob, uh, concerning the, the people in the land of, of Israel, they'll represent them and that answer to that promise God made preserve his people and keep his promise to them. There are those who seem to think God is finished with Israel, that they no longer have a place in his plan. But the scripture clearly refutes that idea soundly, very clearly. The apostle Paul explained it this way, for I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As is written, therefore, come out of Zion, the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's in Romans chapter 11, in verses 25 and 26. A heresy being promoted today is that the church has replaced Israel in God's economy of things. That's a heresy teaching. Nothing can be farther from the truth. See here, what they call that is replacement theology. Replacement theology is bad theology. Okay? The church is being used of God in this present dispensation of time 
But our time is limited in the church dispensation. It's going to come to an end, ultimately. The chosen people of God, the chosen people of God, the nation of Israel, uh, will experience the fulfillment of the new covenant to be exalted above the nation just as the prophet Jeremiah predicted. Jeremiah said this, Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I, have, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. That's Jeremiah 30 and verse 10. He said also in Jeremiah 31 and verse 33, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. It will be their God, and they shall be my people. That's in Jeremiah 31, 33. The specific number, 144,000, rules out the possibility of this passage being taken figuratively. It's not figuratively, it's actual. There are literal people Jews from the 12 tribes who were sealed, physically protected, what that means is, they're sealed or physically protected by God. Therefore, those who contend that the 12 tribes of Israel have been lost, however, this text reveals that God knows exactly, he knows exactly where they are and who they are. Is there anything too hard for God? No. He knows where they are. The 12 tribes of Israel are listed in various places throughout Scripture, but they're not always listed in the exact same one. The unique, one unique feature about this listing here in Revelation 7 of the tribes is that Judah is mentioned first in the list, before the firstborn Reuben. So, we are not told why, but it could be due to the place of the tribe of Judah and the coming of the Messiah. Jesus was of the tribe of Judah, as was King David, of whom the Messiah was to be descended. And so another unique feature that is that Levi is listed in this list. The list which describes the allotment of the land of Israel is omitted because Levi received no land inheritance due to the uh, fact that Levi was of the priestly tribe, but he's in this list. See, God was born, excuse me, not God, Gad, excuse me, Gad was born to Zippah, Leah's handmaid, as was Asher. Naphtali was born to Bila, Rachel's handmaid. Manasseh was the eldest of Joseph's two sons. Jacob claimed Joseph's sons for himself, as you read in Genesis 48, verse 5. And so Simeon was born to Leah, as was Levi, Eskar, and Zebulun. Dan was omitted from the list. We're not told why. Maybe some have suggested that it's because Dan's early involvement with idolatry, possibly, as you read in Judges chapter 18, verse 30. And some commentators, some who study the Bible, scholars, have said that 145,000 will be the greatest missionary force the world has ever known. The Bible does not say. And so from little info that we do have, it would seem that the 144,000 are in hiding for three and a half years from the time of the Antichrist reveals himself and initiates the persecution against Israel until the end of the tribulation period. They're in hiding for that three and a half years. And that's in uh, Revelation chapter 12, and verse 6. So at the end of the tribulation period, the 144,000 are seen with the Lamb on the Mount Zion with the Father's name written in their foreheads. Okay, Revelation 14 and verse 1. So basically, uh, as you look on in our scripture, describing the 12 tribes and the 144,000 here, in verses 9 through 17, we talk about the innumerable multitude. 
I'll try to get through this quickly as I can. It says in verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. In her hands, and I and cried with a loud voice, saying, "Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb." And all the angels stood around about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, "Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen." And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, "What are these which are arrayed in white robes?" And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which come out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So, this is an innumerable multitude standing before the throne. After seeing the 144,000 who were to be sealed before the outpouring of God's wrath, John saw this great multitude which no man can number, he says here. This was a different group altogether from the 144,000. Their number was unspecified, unlike the 144,000. Also, this group was from all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues, as he says in Revelation 5, 9, and also right here in this verse, verse 9, chapter 7. They are made up of Jews and Gentiles. This great throng of people stood before the throne of God in heaven, clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands. The white robes are indicative or indicates here of the righteousness uh, they are have received on account of their faith in Christ. These are the saved. And the palm branches are symbols of rejoicing in joy. In verse 10, they cry out, in this verse 10, in unison, with a loud voice, giving glory to God, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Salvation is a great gift of God. It's a great gift of God. We're in he meets the greatest need of man. To be saved is the greatest need we have. Because man is marred by sin, he is desperately in need of a savior. And since there is nothing a man can do to save himself, he is completely dependent upon God to meet that need. Salvation is indeed the work of God. And as such, it brings glory to God. In eternity past, it was determined within the divine trinity that God the Father would send his only begotten Son into the world to provide salvation for man through his redemption and sacrifice, God's plan to save us. Jesus, the Lamb of God, gave himself as the once and for all offering for sin. Thus, the expression of the praise is to God and under the Lamb, the praise here. And so verse 11, the multitude was then joined by all the angels, which stood around about the throne. The word all is limited by the context here, obviously. Otherwise, it would, must include the entirety of all the created angelic order, including those who fell with Satan in rebellion. But they're not there. So uh, the immediate context is the four angels who were stationed at the four corners of the earth, plus the one who cried out to them. 
The broader context would include the seven angels of the seven churches mentioned in Revelation 2 and chapter, chapter 2 and chapter 3, as well as the many angels seen about the throne as we read in Revelation 5.11. That's the angels that were there, all the angels. And so this latter group of angels fits well with the verses as they again are seen round about the throne, the circle of the throne, along with the elder and the four beasts. And the 24 elders and the four beasts joined in with the angels and they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. Now I can't finish this this morning, we're running out of time. I want to say this, please, Please, please read the rest of this and study the reference scriptures you'll find in your Bible with this. Because it's so critical to understand that these are the saved here standing before the throne. These are the angels of God who are with God standing around about the throne. And they're all worshiping God. It's important to worship God, to praise God. These have been spared. We have a lot to be thankful for as Christians. Amen. God gave his son for us. We can spend eternity in heaven with our Heavenly Father and with our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, because of what he did for us. He did for us what no one can do for us in the giving of his son for our sins. We are spared the wrath of God to the point here this morning. And this chapter 7 lays between when the wrath of God is going to be poured out. And we're not going to be there when it's poured out. That's the point. And praise God. God loves his children. Amen. So please study ahead. And we'll be in chapters 8 and 9.